Nicole. You saw that, right? I love it. Yeah, it's pretty nice. I love it. I'm a big fan of that. Well, welcome. This is the Listen to This Bull live show. And this is the show where we have a guest on. We talk about a topic. Today's topic is um, engineers in the insurance restoration world. You know, all the things that they do. And we'll probably get into some details on some very technical stuff because I really like that kind of stuff. Uh, but we have Matt Phelps with APEC Engineering in the wings waiting for us. Oh, I'm, I'm Matt Mulholland, by the way. I'm Remington Huggins. Yeah. So Hope you all are doing well this afternoon. Sure and are. I can't. I'm excited for today's show with Matt coming on. He's the father of Michael Phelps. <laughs> this is going to be an exciting be. one. I'm that would excited. be really interesting if he was. It would be. Um, I didn't ask him that yet, so we get to ask him that live. I'm, I'm sure that he's going to say no. Yeah, well, we'll find out. I will place a bet, though, if you'd like. We'll find out. You're not going to place a bet? Uh, I feel pretty good about this bet, Remington. Yeah, we're just going to let that one go. All right, that's probably a smart move. <laughs> probably a smart move. Mr. Phelps, welcome to the show. How Thank you doing, you. buddy? Glad to, glad to be here. So you are an engineer for or with APEC Engineering. Is this your company? Yes, I'm I'm the 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 largest stockholder in the company. That'd be a yes for sure. Yeah. So you could basically just tell everybody else to just piss off and they, they would have to leave, right? <laughs> No, I tell everybody else to please show up at work on time because we got way too much to be done by one individual. That was a very uh, political statement or answer. <laughs> well done. Well done. I have been looking forward to having an engineer on this show for a long time, Matt. Um, we've attempted to get a few of the carrier engineers on and they declined for obvious reasons. Um, can't say that I blame them. It kind of would have been picked on a little bit, but we wouldn't give them a hard time. No, no. this <laughs> show. No, <laughs> we would never. We're very nice. If you still want to come on and you're from Donan, we're very nice people. <laughs> I think Matt's looking for someone. So <laughs> this show, if, if you haven't watched it, you probably don't because you're a busy man, but it, Generally, we have a live audience questions coming in through comments. So during this entire process, uh, if someone asks a question and it makes sense for the conversation that we're having, then we'll pull that question up on the screen and we'll ask it live for you. All right. Very good. All right. So but until they start asking questions, I've got a whole bunch of them. Let them go, Matt. Let it let it rip. I feel like. We yeah. Address. Bring them on. Yeah. <laughs> When we saw each other last, Matt, uh, you and your team shot the shit with me. Do you remember that? I do. Is that liter literally? That's what we did. So <laughs> at the Win the Storm conference, you guys have a hail cannon. Who built that cannon, by the way? It was built by Dr. Milton Smith at Texas Tech University. Ah, nice. How did they determine... I guess it was, is it, is there any friction inside the tube from the hailstone? Sure. Um, the, the purpose or the, the way that the process works is the wind energy uh, picks up the hailstone within the tube and is moving the, the hail at approximately the same velocity as the wind itself when it exits the tube. And generally speaking, it's thought of that the hailstone is, or ice ball is lifted by the wind as it is in the tube. So it's not actually touching the tube at all. There's wind that's going around it all the way around the, the uh, ice ball as it is moving down the tube. So it's got kind of a buffer, and it's interesting that you're calling the, uh, the air pressure wind. I guess that that makes it a little bit easier when you're describing what is occurring? Yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to help non-technical folks understand what it is that we're doing. I mean, we are building air pressure in a, in a tank and then releasing it, which would be like blowing wind. And that's what propels the ice ball to the target. Hmm. So let me uh, 
finish the story, I guess. So there's a hail cannon, and and that's my wife. He, he can <laughs> let me play with it if he wants to. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> You know he's thinking over here ways to have one of these in his garage. Like it's it's definitely sinking in over Look, here. Look, what she doesn't want to tell you is that she and I actually had a whole discussion about how to build one of these things over the weekend. I don't doubt she, it. She's a an engineering type herself, and we enjoyed that conversation greatly. So, um, I'm not letting you get away with that one, Ashley. So we have these foam turds at when the storm for our booth because our booth was about bullshit like the show is um, yeah so we, we these, shot it and you shot it with a hail cannon so and it was we, awesome we, we literally blew up your shit you did you did so we did two of them and uh one of them like a ricochet shot it was a little bit off center and it, and it was cool but the second shot was dead center and we got a slow motion impact of it. I'm using this footage, by the way, to talk about the loss of energy efficiency or value in spray foam insulation based on hail. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a useful uh, footage as well, but it was pretty cool because it bounced right off and took someone's knees out or really came close to doing that. I like it. We have a, a client in Minnesota that we've done, oh, I don't know, maybe a dozen or so. Uh, investigations for where we've been able to show how much the R value was reduced by the hail impacts on the uh, uh, polyurethane foam insulation. I think that's fantastic. So we're basically going to be pulling from all those kinds of informational sources in order to talk about how shooting the shit really leads to um, R value reduction. Because that yeah, had, he's, he's has he's got he's had a a. a a good settlement on all of his cases that we have been involved with. Do you think there's a higher R value in real shit or fake shit? <laughs> well, it depends on the shit. <laughs> <laughs> Is it frozen? Is it not? Yeah, like, where are we? <laughs> uh, when I saw this machine at Wind the Storm, I was, I mean, I, I think I sat around it for an hour just watching these ice balls be shot. Like, I was just intrigued. I loved it 100%. Uh, well, thank you. Thank yeah, you. Your, your guys' operation there was uh, was great. It really was. Every, and it was well, entertaining. Thanks. I appreciate I mean, that. I think I was like four people back from the actual ice throwing machine. Yeah. Ice cannon. Let me ice be, cannon. let me, let me say the scientific. I mean, to me, it looked like a shirt cannon that was uh, retrofitted for ice. <laughs> well, actually, it was built for that exact purpose. And uh, it's the nicest looking one that we have. And it's the small, uh, the, it is one of, it is the only one that we own that will travel. All the others are, the tanks are too big and, you know, they're too, mm -hmm. they're too, they're permanently mounted. They're, they're not on an assembly that can be rolled around. And uh, so this one works real well to take it to a show because we can, you know, roll it around on the wheels on the, on the carriage. So that makes it a lot more transportable. Well, let me ask you some questions about it though. Uh, because it, as fun as it is to watch ice balls be shot at any kind of material, especially shit. Um, there is some question on how much data, useful data, you might actually get from that. You've got perfect spheres so that it can go through the tube. And you've got spheres that have uh, no air inside of them, really, unless you're working on some way of pumping air bubbles into the ice ball for different densities. When Haig or another engineering firm uses data from one of these machines to uh, simulate hail and then uses that data. How accurate is that compared to real life conditions? Well, it can be, it can be misleading or it can be highly accurate. Uh, hailstones, uh, if you use the FM standard for hail impact testing, you use a hailstone that is crystal clear, that is void of any, um, uh, uh, air bubbles inside the, the sphere. And then the 
maximum distance between the chronograph, which measures the speed of the hailstone or the ice sphere, it must be exactly five feet from the target. And not everybody does that. In fact, there's uh, a paper that I published last month in the uh, Journal of Wind Engineering and Industrial Aerodynamics that discusses in detail the outcomes of engineers who fail to accurately measure the distance from the chronograph to the point of impact because the hailstone is slowing down the further it travels. Or perhaps it'd be better to say the further it travels, the more it slows down. And that's the reason the FM Global Standard is five feet. But we have lots of reports that have been done by a variety of, of engineers that fail to report the distance between their chronograph and the target, the point of impact. And so there's no way of being able to verify their data because we don't know how much it's slowed down. All they're reporting is the speed of the chronograph at the at the point that it goes through the chronograph, but that's not exactly the same speed at which the impact occurs. And this is especially biased for smaller hailstones, say uh, one inch in diameter. A larger hailstone, one that's say two or three inches in diameter, has enough momentum that its reduction in speed over a distance of five feet is not very much, it's insignificant. But a smaller hailstone, one that's say one inch in diameter, it is. And so if people are not, that are doing this type of testing are not calculating the reduction in speed based upon distance or the size of the hailstone that they are using, they are going to overstate the damage threshold and come up with misleading uh, damage threshold values. So it would be That's overstated. Especially true, especially true for one inch hail. I honestly would have thought it would have been the opposite way around since a larger hailstone would have more drag with more surface area hitting the air. Uh, but I guess it does, it does have all those. Inertia. It does have all those things. You are correct, but the, it has so much more momentum due to its mass yeah. that the loss in velocity over the first five feet or so once it exits the chronograph is less than it. Uh, is for a smaller hailstone, which has less momentum due to its lower mass. Can I ask you about uh, the papers that engineers write? You kind of cut out your, your voice, kind of cut out. Let me ask you about um, engineering papers. When, when an engineer writes a paper, uh, a white paper of some kind, and, and goes into some data that they are able to produce, do they have a peer review set up for these kinds of papers in our industry? It, it depends on the journal in which it is published. If you publish in a peer reviewed journal, such as the Journal of Wind Engineering or Industrial Aerodynamics, or even the journal uh, for the, uh, um, uh, what we used to call the, uh, uh, Oh, a roofing association. I can't think of the name of it right now. Um, they they have a peer review in their journals. I've, I've published a couple of papers in their journal. It's called Interface, but uh, and it's uh, used to be called the uh, International Roofing Institute, and I now think that they've got a, a different name, but I don't remember what it is. However, a lot of guys just publish stuff and put it on their web page. Uh, Hague Engineering, for example, has done this on numerous occasions. So you have no idea if it's been peer reviewed or not. Does but it get any kind of designation written on it when it's been peer reviewed? They should. Uh, well, a paper is supposed to have a footer on it that gives the journal in which it was uh, published, the volume number, and the date that it was published. And then you can look up that specific journal about what is their peer review process. Now, some of them that are chiefly academic journals, like uh, uh, 
the Journal of Wind Engineering and Industrial Aerodynamics, they have a very prescribed peer review process. So the peer reviewer never knows who the, the person is that's writing the paper, and the person who submitted the paper never knows who the peer reviewers are. And they receive comments, and they have to address those comments. And either the comment is addressed and closed, or the comment is determined to be unresponsive and uh, uh, it can be removed, uh, or the paper's not going to get published. It's just that simple. And so uh, the peer review process is intended not to limit what you say and not to limit thought, but it is intended to ensure that everything that is appearing in that journal meets the standard of good science and has been, uh, the data has been collected and analyzed in a way that is consistent with good stewardship for this industry. So Remington, now that you know this information, do you think that a jury would care if a report that's used for a basis of denial has never been peer reviewed or published in a journal? Absolutely. I, I've known this information because I've deposed many engineers. And I ask them these questions. Well, do you have any publications? Yes. Are they peer reviewed? Yes or no. And then I branch out my questions from there. If it's not peer reviewed, I'm certainly going to use it against that expert or that engineer in front of the jury. There's no doubt about it because let's just be honest. It's, it's the internet. You can, anybody can post anything, right? It doesn't mean it's right or wrong. The fact that something's peer reviewed actually has some foundation to what's actually the substance or data in that report, right? And well, uh, one of the things that we have seen in a lot of, with some engineers, this is particularly true of Hague Engineering, that they in, it will bear the seal of two different engineers. And they are making the statement that the second engineer did a peer review of the first engineer's product. Now, okay. just a few minutes ago, you heard me say that a proper peer review means that the peer reviewer does not know the author and the author does not know the peer reviewer. If they both work at the same company, that sounds a little fishy to me. So bit. there's a peer review that's done right. And then there's a peer review that's just intended to put some shine on the apple. A and bit. that's not what we're talking about. Do you think a report for a specific uh, property that has been peer reviewed internally does that have any real weight to it? Uh, that's not the same thing as, as a white paper with scientific data for um, peer review that it's published in a journal. An individual report, does it have the same criteria for peer review? Because they use the same terminology. If it's just an internal review, that, that's no peer review at all. You know, that's just, that's just spit shine the apple that doesn't have any meaning of substance. I have to say that as an attorney, I don't necessarily think that every report has to be peer reviewed. And I see what you're saying, like double stamped, but you know, the articles and, and things of that effect, I think it's just normal process where it's supposed to give more credibility to that article or white paper if it is peer reviewed. Yeah. You know? No, I'm with you. I, it's it's the it's the terminology that they use sometimes saying it's uh, it's peer reviewed is really interesting. So let's say I, I got I got some specific questions. Bullshit that I've come across from engineers and maybe you could respond to them. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll just laugh. I, I don't really know. Some of this is actually pretty funny. Um, would you ever put into an engineer report? that it is acceptable to paint asphalt shingles in order to have them match the surrounding materials? I've never, I've never agreed with that. And I've never done that. I have seen it done in reports that have been issued by uh, other engineers. I don't agree with that. And this is the reason why. When that shingle was sold, it met certain ASTM standards in regard to uplift resistance, in regard to UV light resistance, and in regard to fire resistance. And so those properties are not going to be restored by painting it. 
And so also that shingle had an ASTM certification for it. Then it was not a painted shingle when it got that certification. So the goal here should be that we are restoring the roof to its pre-loss condition. And that included the ASTM certifications upon which those shingles were sold and installed. And if we are veering away from that, then we haven't delivered to that property owner what they paid for. And so I'll be honest, that was a much more detailed answer than I thought I would get. I honestly just thought you would laugh and say, yeah, that's bullshit. <laughs> you you actually went into it. He's providing a real answer. Uh, he's a real Concrete answer. Yeah. Answer with some foundation. I, I mean, it's it. just it's obvious yeah. bullshit. I, I got a question from the audience. When does manufacturers' technical service bulletins matter? Well, they always matter. Uh, for example, if you have a a structure that's on the Texas Gulf Coast, it's going to be either in the seaward wind zone or inland one and, or inland two. And each of those has a specific wind speed requirement that must be met, not just for the installation, but also for the product itself. So you have to have a product that shows in its documentation that it was designed to be compliant with that design wind speed. So if you don't have that, and you try to put that on and you go to get windstorm insurance in Texas, you're going to find out your roof's not eligible. You have to comply with those technical specifications or you're not even insurable. And this is a, this is a big case. It, I mean, a big issue. It happens a lot. And frequently it happens when we have an out of town roofer that does not know the local rules. And they brought in, you know, 10 semi truckloads of shingles from wherever they came from. And they don't know what the rule requirements are. And they find out that those 10 truckloads of shingles can't even be used along the Texas Gulf Coast at all. And we've had we've had this happen. This is not a a uncommon thing. It has happened several times in the course of my career. So, yeah, you know, if you don't read the specifications, you're putting a roof on at your own peril. Yeah. There are a lot of questions popping up for one particular individual. <laughs> <laughs> is there an alternative method of selling felt under layman other than the explicit manufacturer's instructions that is acceptable? How often can you get away from manufacturer recommended instructions? I would recommend that you never attempt to get away from manufacturer recommended instructions. You would recommend? Always follow the manufacturer's recommendations. That's the That's safe course of action. That's, Anytime That's you true. deviate from that, you have put either yourself or your client at risk needlessly. All you got to do is comply with what it says. Why take the risk? Just comply with what it says. Charge of their audience. Price. All they now have to do is go to this show and go to 23 minutes and 30 seconds in and play that little snippet of what you just said <laughs> to the adjuster that's trying to get them to not go by manufacturer recommendations. That's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. That, that they're they're headed down the a wrong path when they do that. As soon as I've, I've done thousands of inspections on roofs for compliance with the Texas Windstorm Insurance Association requirements. And I've had to turn down most of them and the most frequent offender far away, more frequent than anything else is they attempted to use products that are not approved for the wind zone in which the structure is located. And it's so simple to avoid, you know, pick up the phone and call somebody. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, this is not rocket science. This is easy stuff, but someone's got to do it before they show up with the hammers and nails. You know, you gotta, you gotta have a little bit of, uh, management a little bit of timing in play here so that you show up only with the correct products i love it i, I i've reviewed probably thousands of engineering reports from the insurance carrier thousands. and they love to think, name the product on the that's roof. a little exaggerated right they, no i just no this is for I'm real just kidding. this is for real <laughs> you look at the and they love to put what the product is on the roof but i've never seen ever 
an engineering report from an insurance carrier in which they say to follow the guidelines or manufacturer specifications. I've never seen that. They always want to put duct tape on it. You know, yeah. I mean, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> Would you ever use duct tape to fix a shingle? Now, that one is a good laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I've, have you met? Have you ever Duct seen tape any? fixes everything, Remington? I don't want to get into this one. I have very hard feelings here. <laughs> have you ever seen an engineering report from a carrier in which they actually say you need to follow the the specifications of this manufacturing guidelines from a carrier? No, I don't I, think I have. Let me ask you a question, real quick, important. Matt. Something that's near and dear to me, and and a lot of the people. Uh, from Georgia, the state that I do most of my work in. Uh, we often see engineer reports that talk about discontinued materials and the engineer makes a statement of what materials are currently like kind of quality to that material. How do you feel about an engineer determining what like kind of quality is? It depends on how they say that. Um, I don't have a problem with it provided that they do it right. So like kind and quality, that doesn't mean price and it doesn't mean color. I mean, certainly color is matching as an issue, but what like kind and quality is, does it meet the same specifications? That's what like kind and quality is. It needs to be the same specifications in the same color or an acceptable alternative. And it is not either the carrier's choice or the owner's choice to comply or not comply with the standard requirements. They must only always comply with the standard requirements. Uh, years ago, um, a fellow wrote a book called uh, uh, Quality is Free. And in this book, he wrote, quality is not a measure of goodness. Quality is conformance to the requirements. And so, the requirements are clearly stated in the building code and there may be local amendments to it like we have down here in the Texas Gulf Coast. And quality is complying with those things. And that's what everybody should do, whether they're the carrier or the homeowner or the, the contractor. Comply with the requirements and that's the best way to succeed. I got a question here, but I'm going to ask you a follow up question before you answer it. What is the definition of repair? I let me, let me talk to you about definitions in general, though. Um, often an engineer might use a different definition than what the carrier is using. And, and a lot of times that can cause some confusion for the carrier side and it pro might provide them with a basis for denial uh, just because they're using terminology differently than what the policy might say. Is there a specific definition book that engineers tend to follow or is that an internal thing that every engineer firm seems to have their own of? First off, good question, Matt. I want to know the answer to this. Well, Remington, you're going to really like this answer. Uh, Matthew, it's, it's basically <clears throat> up to the engineering engineer or the engineering firm. In my firm, the definitions come from one source and that is Remington, get your pencil ready. I got it. I'm ready to go. Black's so, Law Dictionary. Yep. Black's I Law? It. I love it. Black's really? Law. That's where, we, that's where we get the definitions from. So if I have to spell out what is the definition of dam damage, what is the definition of repair, it comes from Black's Law Dictionary. Do you think that's just you or that's most engineers? Um, I'm sad to say I think it's mostly just me. I, oh. I don't see other engineers doing this. Yeah, we don't either. But that, that's a great way to define terms. How, how can you argue against it? I mean, seriously, it, it's a great it's a it's a great source for you to use for defining any type of term. I really do believe that's it. Well, I have a, a very good friend that uh, is a, a splendid engineer and architect. His name is Neil Hall from uh, Metairie, Louisiana. And Neil and I had a discussion about this and I said, Neil, what are you what are you seeing? What are you experiencing in all of these uh, uh, ice damming roof claims? And he said, well, we get a lot of, of questions that, well, the building code doesn't require us to do that here in, you know, name your town in Louisiana. And the, he has had lots of 
of uh, attorneys and depositions and things that have asked him, does that make sense to not do that? And what Neil said, and I just, I think it is such a, a solidly good answer is what makes sense is to follow the building code. And that's what they did. Now, in this case, the building code did not require something that, you know, we had unprecedented cold weather in February and a lot of people, myself included, experienced a lot of broken pipes and equipment because of the freezing weather and we lost power and, you know, we all learned oh, yeah. the name ERCOT and what it means. But uh, that is uh, unfortunate that that happened and it happened to a lot of people and it's covered a wide area. But what Neil was making the point that was so sound and so good is that do what the building code says. What and they said, does that make sense? And he says, yes, what makes sense is to follow the building code. I like that. Um, you're, you're in Texas, right? Yes. So you, you well, I'm licensed, have all those... about, I'm licensed in about 30 states, but I, I reside states. in Texas and my laboratory is in Texas. I've seen that list and, and all the states that I work in, luckily you're licensed, which is really cool. Oh, well, um, good. <laughs> Cause you might be getting some work for me. Um, th there was a question posted and I think that they spelled this wrong, but this is pretty funny. He says, uh, you sound like Dr. Phil for construction. Have you everybody, anybody ever told you you sound like Dr. Phil? I was on a cruise with, uh, my wife and I were on a cruise with another yeah, couple and, uh, our wife, we got down to Cozumel and our wife's got up to go shopping and Mick and I stayed at her table and, had another cup of coffee and wanted to read the paper and a couple comes bustling over to me and said, Oh, we are such huge fans. It's so God, I can't believe we finally got to see you. Oh man, where's this one? And they went on and on and on. And I finally said, listen, the next time you're in Burbank, come on by the studio. We'd love to have you on. And oh, 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 that was so great. And my friend looked up and he said, never again, not in the rest of your life will you ever, ever have something like that happen again. And I swear to God, not five minutes later, here comes another couple. Oh, my God, it's him. It's him. <laughs> oh, it's... So, funny. yeah, I get that sometimes. That's pretty funny. That's awesome. Of course, Dr. Phil is on it's TV, terrible. and, you know, he gets asked about that, too. He goes, oh, you know, I get asked if I'm Matt Phelps all the time. You know, <laughs> what are you doing with this guy? It's like, how's the ice cannon going? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got a lot of it. Uh, eye stamming is something that does not normally happen in Texas. It's it's fairly rare down here. And we had unprecedented cold weather in February, set records all across the state. And eye stamps form on the top of a roof at the end of the eave, on the part of the eave that sticks out beyond the wall. And so that part does not receive any heat. And so when water, or excuse me, when ice or snow begins to melt higher up on the slope by the ridge and it runs down and it hits the eave where it's still frozen, it freezes. And this happens over and over throughout the, the winter or throughout the storm. And it forms a dam, literally a dam made out of ice. When the liquid water hits the dam, it backs up, it piles up against it. And as it backs up, it goes underneath the roof covering. It gets underneath the underlayment. <clears throat> it moves through the decking, plywood, OSB, whatever it might be. And it either gets in the wall or it gets in the attic space. Both of those are bad. Typically <laughs> the wall it's and the attic bad. space. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Typically, the, the wall or the attic space is insulated with fiberglass insulation. And when it gets soaked with water, its insulation properties tend trend down to zero. So now you wind up getting cold air inside the attic that is now penetrating down into the structure and it's freezing pipes along the way. I've had a client that had the fire suppression sprinkler in its house that it burst the piping 
And so now we have this cascading failure that is continuing on from one elevation down to a lower elevation. And in the case I'm speaking of, it got into the electrical panel, shorted out the electricity, they lost power, and it froze piping all the way down to the ground and cost lots and lots of money to uh, get it repaired. So this happens sometimes. It's really unfortunate. Uh, and it's it's been a big issue here in Texas, primarily because we don't normally have ice damming. And a lot, of, a lot of guys don't know how to investigate that. They don't know what to look for. And they're having a hard time proving it if they don't have the experience of how to handle an ice damming claim. I'm very fortunate. I got to do a lot of these when I was in uh, uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and New York back when Hurricane Sandy occurred. And we had several ice damming claims that were associated with that period of time. It happens a lot more frequently up there. Okay? You have the, the weather that supports that type of thing. We normally don't have that here in Texas. But the bottom line is during that period in February, we did. And that's, so, that's what caused all of the, the, the problems that we had. So we're getting a question that says, do yeah. ice dams usually happen in a single event like one day or happen over a week or two? Is there a possible issue of ice damming being a single event? Uh, Frank Dalton, you are a smart guy and you asked a good question. He is a smart uh, guy. Very good question. I, I will tell you this. Yes, it can. And yes, it does. Yes. And that's exactly what we had happen here in Texas back in February. But that's not going to happen in Florida, Frank. So, yeah, you probably, you said that probably in not going to see that in year. Florida. I hope to God we don't see it in Texas anymore either. <laughs> Us Southern guys, we don't, we're not used to this ice damming. So, when, when an yeah. ice dam occurs and, and you've got some water damage in the walls, this is a question about the national insurance uh, or a flood insurance program. But it's pertinent here. I've had a lot of issues with NFIP claims over the replacement of damaged exterior wall sheathing. FEMA presumes that the sheathing can be replaced from the interior, but I haven't heard a valid argument that says that that's a proper scope of repairs. Do you happen to know if sheathing can be replaced from the interior? Most of the time when this comes up, the, the, uh, in this case, FEMA is looking for a way to replace the structural sheathing without having to remove the brick facade on the outside. Right. Um, and unfortunately it's, it cannot be done and be constructed in a code approved way. The only way that they can do it is to remove the uh, exterior uh, uh, cladding, whether it's brick or whatever it might be because you cannot get the nailing pattern with the types and sizes of nails that are required, trying to slip the sheathing in between the studs and align it and then somehow attach it. You might can get the sheathing in there, but you cannot match the nailing schedule that is required for whatever the requirement is for that building code. So you go, go back to what I said in the very beginning. Let's just follow the code and get over with it. So yeah. if you can't do that, trying to save a nickel by relieving, by re keeping the brick in place, just go ahead and remove it and uh, put the sheathing on correctly. Safety is a lot more important than uh, saving a nickel on whether or not you remove the brick and reinstall it or not. So sometimes you might see an engineer report from, I was about to say from the carrier side, but I guess it could be from any just stupid engineer that might say something that just doesn't make any sense. What do you normally do in those circumstances? Well, you know, professional behavior is always important for someone like me. And so I will question the engineer and ask him to clarify his point. And then I will answer, I will reply to him from what the building code says and what it is required. And I can point out that what he has suggested is not compliant with the building code and that local code officials as well, as well as the state board of professional engineers tends to take a rather dim view of engineers recommending that they do something that is not compliant with the building code. So you have you filed complaints against other engineers then? 
I haven't. I have. I have counseled engineers that I felt like had put their foot over the line, and I have not ever uh, referred someone to the board for disciplinary action, except in a case where the engineer had made a clear intentional misleading statement or a lie that was going to get somebody hurt. Uh, but normally I do not uh, refer someone to the board. Do you ever find that there's an engineer report that you look over and it appears to be leaving out information on purpose? I'm sad to say more often than not. Yeah. That's the kind of stuff we deal with more often than not. I vote yes as well. It's all the horrible. time. All the time in depositions, I find out that photos are left off. Some information is left off. Go figure. And it's, mis it's, it's misleading. Purposely, yeah. it seems. Uh, but proving the intent, I'm sure, is the biggest issue there. Oh, for sure. For sure. If, if you could prove intent for leaving out information that's pertinent to the claim, would that be fraudulent? If, if we can prove intent that they're not providing information in a report to benefit the carrier and not provide coverage, I think there's something there. I really do. Mm. Do you think having a boilerplate kind of a report where it seems to be the same from one property to the next with just general information changed or very but it's all very very similar roughly the same boilerplate you think that's appropriate Matt? no I, I don't i think that's very poor engineering and shows a complete lack of professionalism we don't do that we do have templates that we use but they have to be refilled with data for each specific case for example we have spreadsheets that we use that we calculate the amount of kinetic energy in a hailstone impact, but you have to fill it full of information every time you do it. So it's, you know, what is the pitch on the roof and what is the wind speed that is occurring during the hail fall event. And so there's, and, and what, and of course, what is the size of the hail? So there's a lot of variables that have to be put in to do the same mathematics. Um, and, you know, we, we use those. They're kind of like templates, I suppose. But uh, they're not uh, something that you can just put in a new address and mm. use the same thing over. It, it doesn't work that way. You, you got to do the math. You got to, you know, I, I built this company based upon engineering science and mathematics. And I've been successful with this. And the reason we've been successful is that we give the 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 data we give the facts voice so that they can speak for themselves as to what has occurred here you know I, I know that there's engineers out there that will try to you know shine the argument in favor of their client whomever that client might be we don't do that if, if the favors if the if the engineering data says that it's not damaged we're going to tell the client right up front, you don't have a good case here. It's not damaged. It's not what you think it is. We tell them that the very first day, if that's what the data says. And then sometimes you can't tell just by looking at it. You know, it's like this. I bet everybody that's listening to this has someone in their family or someone that they know or love that has died from cancer. Well, doctors can't find cancer by simply looking at the patient. They find it by testing. And that's what we do. We find damage by testing. You can't always just have a casual visual appearance and tell if something's damaged. In fact, a lot of times you can tell more by taking the roofing material and cutting it out and flipping it upside down and looking at it than you can from just looking at it on the surface. Guys don't do that. I've had lots and lots of cases that turned on the fact that the engineer that opposed me didn't even bother to cut a sample. How could they have done any analysis at all when they didn't even bother to cut a sample?
It was so unimportant to them that they didn't even cut a sample and attempt to do any type of ASTM standard testing on it or determine what uh, evidence it might contain. And that's what we've built our company on. That's the reason we're successful is we go the extra mile that not everybody's willing to do. There's a, and, there's a and we are accredited for it. My laboratory is accredited by the International Accreditation Service. That means they send inspectors out and they look up under a skirt while we're doing these tests and they compare what we're doing, what they visually observe to what the standard requires. And then they check off. Yeah, these guys are doing it right. So if you, if you, if you need samples tested and you don't want to use my lab, that's fine. But for pity's sake, Using the credit, don't just send it down to Joe Schmuck, who you don't really know what he's doing. Send it to a lab that has been accredited and that they have proved to an accrediting agency that they know how to do it right and they do it right. Matt, do you care if I, I steal your phrase next time I'm in closing arguments at trial? And that is, I'm just trying to give the facts a voice. And I, I, yeah. I love that. that. That's awesome, man. It really is. Well, thank that, you. That's a good thing. I thought you were going to say is- Joe Schmuck. <laughs> well, I'll use that too when you know, the, the adjusters on the stand. But <laughs> that's a really great saying. I like. It. I love it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Kind of across Thank the you. board. Yeah, I didn't know there was an accreditation there. It, do you know? Do you happen to know if um, Hague is accredited? I'm sorry. Do you happen to know if the Hague guys that you've talked about a few times? Do you happen to know if they've got an accreditation? Yes, they are accredited by IAS. Uh, I have an acquaintance that works there by the name of Scott Morrison, who is their lab manager. He's a good engineer. Uh, And Scott um, has some definite opinions about how they do things and what he will do and what he won't do. When he saw that I had my lab accredited, he began a process to get their lab accredited. And not long after my lab was accredited, they they got their lab accredited. So basically, but you were for example, first. we have as one of our accreditation procedures that we wash samples before we test them. Um, okay. You know, the fact is, is that soil on, or windblown debris on a roof can make it give a false pass because you're testing mud on top of the roof sample. Huh. Well, we're not there to test mud. We're there to test the roof sample. And the only way to give it a true test is to remove the mud and get it back to its natural condition. Well, how and, do you feel about doing testing on the roof without removing the materials? Uh, like a pull test or something along those lines. Do you need to clean that area? There's a, There are different types of tests. The ones that I'm talking about, which is ASTM 3281, I believe is the number, is uh, a water column, water migration test to test to see if the roof membrane resists the mi- migration of water through it. And those are the ones that, you know, they need to be washed before you do that. And Scott absolutely refuses to do that. So he's got his opinion. I disagree with it, but that's his opinion. So, you know, we're there, we're not there. We're there to test the roof as close to as what it was specified for. Now, I'm the engineer of record on hundreds of roof designs. And in my years of practice, I have never, ever written a specification to tell somebody how much dirt to put on their gosh dang roof. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Ro- dirt on the roof <laughs> is windblown debris. It's not part of the roof design. So you have to wash it off. And you take a roof that's been in service for, say, 10 or 12 years, especially in, say, Dallas, Texas, all the dust storms that we have up here in the Texas Panhandle, guess where they land? They land in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex routinely, and they wind up with a healthy dose of dirt up on top of their roof. So for pity's sake, test the roof, not the dirt. So that means you wash it and remove the dirt. I mean, if it was like a green roof where there was supposed to be something growing on it, you could probably give them a recommendation of how much dirt to put on there based on. (laughs) Maybe so. I I haven't designed any of those, but. uh, Well, you missed your calling. (laughs) We have about 10 minutes left and I have to get this question in. What is to you, Matt, what is the biggest issue or matter that substance wise that you have an issue with, with insurance carriers, engineering reports that you just think is you just disagree with? I would say that they are missing 
facts that are missing and evidence that should be there. <coughs> Pardon me. I, I had a case in uh, Colorado uh, a couple of years ago that the uh, uh, engineer, I don't remember the, who it was, had relied upon a report done by uh, a company called CoreLogic. And uh, CoreLogic has got some really smart guys that work there. They got some good meteorologists. Uh, CoreLogic was originally owned by an insurance carrier group. Uh, it was funded by insurance dollars. Uh, it has since been sold. Uh, and uh, they have uh, an, an ownership. I don't know if it's related to insurance companies or not. But CoreLogic reported in this case that the largest hail that occurred on the property was a half an inch, where the physical evidence on the roof says that it was hit by one and a half inch hail. And I've got hundreds of photos of measured hail impacts that are one and a half inches. And so actually the hail was probably one and three quarters that caused that one and a half inch impact. And so when I looked at the radar footage, I found that there was a hailstorm that was about four mile, four nautical miles from the subject property that had a wind speed blowing towards the subject property at a rate of about 40 knots. And it was from a height that was high enough that the hail that fell out of that cloud, it didn't fall straight down. It fell into a 40 mile an hour wind column that blew it right onto my client's property. Nobody else looked at that. I don't know why, but you know, I, I have I have uh, training in meteorology, specifically in radar meteorology. I am a student in uh, getting my master's degree in meteorology from Mississippi State University, and uh, so I'm I'm very fortunate that I've been well trained in those things. I'm I wouldn't call myself a forecaster, but I'm certainly well equipped for doing forensic work, and. Uh, the bottom line is if somebody doesn't look, there's no way they can put the pieces together. If you're just relying for a prepared report without looking at the data yourself, you can't get down to the facts. And that's what I did. And that's the reason I was able to report <coughs> that the uh, uh, case had been damaged by the hailstone, just as I said that it had. And when we were at Win the Storm uh, a few weeks ago, Matthew and Remington, I ran into that attorney. He's a very good attorney by the name of uh, Evan Wolf. And Evan reported to me and thanked me that the case had settled and really did appreciate the work that I'd done because eventually the carrier overrode their engineer and said, this is what happened. And this is the why they have that damage and the damage profile meshes perfectly with the causation model that, that caused it. And so, you know, when you, when you hire an engineer, most people want to make clear, the engineer should want to make clear that he is documenting a damage profile and then determining the causation model that produced that damage profile. And if they're not doing that, then, you know, they're kind of like someone that's not Mrs. Paul's fish sticks. Throw them back. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, you guys are too young. You don't remember that yes. stuff. <laughs> yes, we're too young. Um, I have so many questions now. So hail fell four miles away. It showed up on the report for being four miles away, 40, not 40 nautical mile winds, blue hail, four miles. How high up was that storm where it was? Do you even, do you know how high up that storm was when it, hit, when it was showed up on the radar, where the sure. radar height was? Sure I, do. sure. I do. The echo tops were up around 45,000 feet. Okay. So, so if, if a hailstone is falling, its terminal velocity at from 45,000 feet would take it about 10 minutes to hit the ground. So if it gets dropped into a wind column that is blowing 40 knots, which would be about 
47, 48 miles an hour. In 10 minutes, it's going to move that over five miles. Wow. So That's it insane. would land specifically, in this case, on my client's property. This explains so much. Though. That is, it explains <clears throat> so much. I can't tell awesome. you how many times I've, I've personally witnessed and had contractors talk to us about trying to find storm damage in an area that has very clear storm data in it, and they don't find anything there. And then they go, you know, a few miles down the road where the, the hail swath doesn't show anything, and that's where they find the damage. This happened recently. A uh, contractor named Josh Swinwood uh, from Refuge Roofing, I think. Anyway, he, he was telling me about this from, from a recent storm. This is amazing. So we need. Well, we and, need and the fact is, off. is that this is very provable using. We just need something that tells us what the wind direction was at the time that the hail fell and what the <laughs> wind speed was. But you're not going to have wind speed from all the layers during that time. So it might have been faster at different layers. Um, it, it, is, it is faster at different layers. And we are able to sample that with a radar. And we do that routinely. That's part of your, you know, you're, you're making me give away some of my, my, my information here. But yeah, with the radar, we measure it at different elevations. We use different tilts of the radar to determine what is the speed of the wind at that elevation. Right, but you have to have someone that does that in real time, or you won't have that data because that that's in the no, that's, that's no, that's 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 incorrect. It's recorded in the radar feed that I download from the National Weather Service months or even years after the fact. So and it's this is change. not limited to real time information. This the the United States Weather Service records every radar moment in every radar in the United States. Um, uh, equipment failure non-withstanding and they're available to you and me right now on every storm in every state on from every radar equipment failures non-withstanding and guess what it's free it's paid for by yours and my tax dollars we don't have to pay anything extra for this we've already paid for it we paid for it with our tax dollars and all you have to do is know how to get it and how to interpret it and that's one of the that's one of the the that's the game ball that I bring to the game. That's mind blowing. I, I, I literally, you, you're giving me some good ammunition here. This is huge. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Matt. I mean, seriously, some of this stuff is, uh, it's kind of mind blowing. It's, uh, I, I, I never thought that a hailstone could really shift That's four to five awesome. miles from That's when it's actually calculated in the atmosphere. It explains so much though. It does. There, there's, a, really there's a question that's been asked that I would like to answer. Sure. And it's from Opie. I, I gave up on the questions. And he says, is an engineer liable or able to be pursued for error and emissions for a faulty or misleading report? Uh, you know, what a great answer. What, what a great question that is. And the answer is yes, absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> an example of this, I can tell you two engineering firms that were prosecuted as a result of false and misleading information in their reports. One was high rise engineering and the other one was U.S. forensics, who were the uh, engineering firms that were uh, called out in the uh, 60 Minutes news program for the reports having been changed by the engineering firm from what the original engineer that wrote the report had actually written. <coughs> and uh, those guys were uh, pursued, they were prosecuted, they were tried, and they were convicted. They all lost their engineering license. I think some of them actually maybe did some time. I don't know if it was community service or what. I don't know the specifics on that. But they did lose their license. And so, you know, can an engineer be held accountable for the errors and omissions that were willfully made that made a faulty or misleading report? You bet. Betcha. You bet. You sure can. There you go. You hear that, engineers? 
Do not put misleading false information in a report. You will be doing community service and you will be picking up windborne debris. I have some trash in my yard that I can't wait to watch you pick up as part of your community service. Uh, but keep in mind that also means don't leave stuff out. Matt, I think we ran out of time. This is one of the best interviews I've ever had. We're, we're going to well, have to come back. Thank you. I appreciate it. This doesn't preclude an engineer having an alternative opinion. They're certainly entitled to that, but it wow. has to be based upon science and engineering, not just upon, you know, whatever. Yeah. Matt, wow. thank I you so, so much. So. This is great. Thank great you. Great if you're okay with it, I, I want to have you on again um, relatively soon. Uh, just because I've got like an hour's worth of extra questions right now. Suddenly we got sure. to sure. We need to. When is your new facility going to be open? Uh, we're going to announce a, uh, a, a lab day to invite people to come in uh, and kind of see what we do and let them push the buttons and see how things work. And it'll probably be you know, maybe the middle of the summer. Uh, we'll let all the windy season for Texas get over with for the spring and get into the summer months where the weather's a little bit more uh presentable and maybe you would like to come and put on a special show or something while uh, you're at lab day yes that absolutely would be awesome. that would be great mark us in only okay. if i get to shoot the cannon you you <laughs> i can assure you that you will <laughs> yes you hear that ashley eat it yeah <laughs> all right matt i appreciate it thank yeah, you matt. You're welcome. thank Good you day. fellas bye-bye yes thank sir you. wow that was wow. awesome that was awesome. Seriously, I, I I learned so much during that just one hour segment right there. Uh, gave me a lot of ammunition, that's for sure. That explains so much. I have to talk to Derek Klein now and find out if he can start putting wind direction at the time of the hail drop in his reports, or at least the average wind speed and direction. I don't know if he'd be willing to do that, to be honest, but it could make a huge difference on where we know the hail actually falls. That would be pretty cool. It would it would be awesome. That I would mean, be enormous for a hail company or hail swath company, a, a mapping company, someone that does weather mapping, whatever that's called. The concept <laughs> is so easy, but it's it, I've never heard an engineer actually explain it like that. It is mind book, guys. Yeah, seriously. Seriously, it's that was awesome. Uh, I can't believe viewers are get this information for free. I mean, seriously. <laughs> no, we're charging. That's the if point. You've watched this you owe us like twelve bucks. <laughs> Listen to this bull's point. Exactly. That was that was awesome. Oh, free. Hey, we're free. flying out to Texas. Let's go check out his facility. Let's get inside. Let's let's let you shoot the cannon. Okay? Yeah, I think that's imperative. You don't want to push a button too. I do. You need. I you do. Need to. I need do. To. <laughs> My wife might want to come. Let's do it. She probably would. Um, yeah, that was a great interview. Uh, well, that's Love it. it. That's the end of the show. And I almost don't want to end it. I want to pull him back on if I could. And, and viewers out there, if, if you didn't get your question in today, send still send in the question. And when we have Matt on in the near future again, we can, we can go through those questions for you. Okay. So Absolutely. that's what we'll do for you. Good point. Good point. And uh, as soon as I get Derek Klein back on the show and we ask him about these issues, we might have Matt Phelps on. I say we get both of them on at the oh same, the same time. Tag team. I want, I want oh our gosh. screen to be in the middle of both of their screens. Though. Like That's a weird. nerd sandwich. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks for watching the show. That was fabulous. Oh, man. Right. See you Great next week. Don't yeah. miss next week. Four o'clock.